Uh, a warm welcome to Dharma in Pyjamas for this morning. As you can see, I'm in yet some more pyjamas. It's still a bit chilly today out there. The, uh, the topic for today is how to make a meal last a lifetime. So, uh, you know, usually if we have a meal, the meal lasts for as long as say we're, at least as we're eating it if we're paying any attention i mean it's debatable sometimes if we're not paying attention it mightn't last very long at all uh and then you know it goes through our body and gets digested and ends up in the toilet and so that's what how many how many hours that's that's pretty much how long a meal will last for and then uh you know we might be able to stretch it out a little bit longer and the nourishment that we've given our body whatever it is that we ate the food for, whatever project we're doing at the time, who we're looking after, going to work, um, that energy might last, you know, for half a day, a day. So that's pretty much, uh, you know, as long as it, as it goes that way. Uh, perhaps if the project continues, then that meal or the benefits from that meal continues for as long as the project and usually that's that's as far as we can stretch it out but from a buddhist point of view we can actually make that one meal last a lifetime by changing our motivation or being bringing awareness to our motivation having a motivation of altruism of eating to benefit others then as long as we are benefiting others that's as long as that meal lasts. So if we have that as a daily practice, altruism, kindness, and, and consciously set our motivation in the morning like that and set our motivation when we're eating, having our breakfast, uh, then the benefits of that meal will last for as long as the motivation. So actually, we can have a meal last longer than a lifetime because if our motivation is a bodhicitta motivation, that everything that we do, we do so that we can become a fully enlightened Buddha so we can lead all beings out of suffering and bring them to the peerless happiness of enlightenment. And that's the reason that we eat. <laughs> then actually the benefit from that meal will last until then, until we are enlightened, until all sentient beings are liberated from suffering and brought to the peerless happiness of enlightenment. So in a way, we can actually make a meal last almost an eternity, <laughs> you know, until absolutely every single living being um, has been liberated from suffering. Uh, so who knew <laughs> that, that a meal could be this powerful? Uh, usually when we eat, um, eating is one of those, the, 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 one of the pinnacles of enjoyment for a materialist in our world or a hedonist. Uh, it's one of the, the, the few things that is left after all the other kind of the partying and the sex and drugs and rock and roll falls away. Then, you know, as people get older, they kind of become foodies and it becomes something that if we don't have anything else in life, it's, um, it's quite a habitual thing to look forward to, to have that sense of anticipation when the endorphins are all released. Uh, but the thing about that is that within the act of eating, uh, it, the enjoyment of eating actually built into it, it turns into its opposite. So if we... If we have a, a liking for Tim Tams, for instance, which in our household we have have an addiction to Tim Tams, the, the first couple of Tim Tams are really delicious. Thinking about them is delicious. Having them is delicious. One, two Tim Tams, really, really nice. But built into that enjoyment is its downfall, isn't it? Changes into its opposite because by about the eighth or ninth Tim Tam, uh-uh, Number 10, number 11th, Tim Tam, really, if you've got a family pack, you're beginning to uh, regret. <laughs> and then what can happen is you can end up uh, just never being able to eat another one again. 
from a Buddhist point of view as well, that pleasure that we experience doesn't actually come from the Tim Tam. Um, it comes because we have the ability to experience pleasure. And that Tim Tam is like a trigger for that ability within us. Even though it appears that the, the joy, the pleasure comes from the Tim Tam. And we can verify this for ourselves because if we're feeling really, really down or really, really angry and we go and eat a Tim Tam, it doesn't have that same, you know, if we're, especially if we're angry, we can't enjoy it. It's tasteless. We may even just throw it on the ground. So the, the, the joy, the pleasure um, doesn't come from the Tim Tam because if it did, it would cure our anger, wouldn't it? <laughs> we have comfort eating, but comfort eating is so short term. It might um, bring a little bit of joy when we're a bit depressed, but doesn't last, does it? And when we're angry, we can't even enjoy it. So actually where that pleasure comes from is from our virtue, that we have uh, good qualities in our mind and um, all of the good things that we've done have laid positive seeds in our mind. And then when something comes along, like a trigger, <laughs> like someone says something to us or we have enjoyed Tim Tam, uh, it ripens that positive seed and we experience happiness. So if we just eat Tim Tams and we experience happiness, what's actually happening um, is that we're using up all of our good karma. All of those karmic seeds are ripening into an experience of pleasure. We enjoy it and they're gone. In a way, we're using up all of our merit. So just by having mindless fun, it's actually quite terrifying that we're using up. It's like we're emptying our bank account of good karma. It's just falling through our fingertips without any awareness. So it's really important that we, um, especially with food, that we bring some awareness to it and not just um, make sure that we don't use up all of our good karma, but that we can actually use it to make more merit. So it's like investing it's like investing the money in your bank account and getting a really good return, dividends. <laughs> so let's see, a couple of things. Uh, just as a sideline, because we do have to eat every day, it's one of these things that's fraught with difficulty, isn't it? Because the fact that we can eat is on the backs of others. It's from all the effort of others. Um, there's many beings that have died so that we can have this food. There's also been a huge amount of history of, um, you know, developments in agriculture, of people working the fields, of people working for labourers' rights, for fair working conditions. All the way back in history, um, you know, results in us being able to just, you know, have a slice of toast. So... From a Buddhist point of view, when we eat our food, it's really important and it's one of the commitments when you take refuge is to dedicate your food or offer it, uh, especially for the benefit of everybody that lost their lives uh, so that we could have that food directly for that food, but also indirectly all the, back th all the way back through history. And the only way really to make uh, that, all of that, bloodshed and toil and effort worthwhile is if we have bring really strong meaning to why we're eating. What's the purpose of this? So everything that we do, we try and have it as harm minimization. That's, that's our starting point. Minimize harm wherever we can. So of course, be vegetarian whenever we can. Um, and if we do eat meat or we eat, uh, any kind of food that is associated either with, you know, like killing insects or anything like that. We try and have the cleanest, um, least harm possible. So the Buddha didn't actually give any uh, rules for not eating meat, mainly because at the time um, the monks and nuns lived on by begging. And so they, they would ha happily accept whatever was offered. Uh, without favoritism, oh, I don't like that or I do like this or anything like that. 
just whatever was offered, that was the way that the villagers made merit by offering to the Sangha. And then the Sangha from their side would have complete equanimity. Thank you very much. Thank you for the food. Um, but of course, from our side, uh, you know, we, we try and make sure that uh, everything comes from the most clean and wholesome source possible. What the Buddha did say was that there's no way that you could go out and purposefully slaughter another living being and then offer it to the Sangha. So, um, you know, uh, His Holiness the Dalai Lama in his very pragmatic way had a wonderful uh, solution to this that... Um, he, uh, you know, traditionally all the, the monasteries in Tibet ate meat because, you know, you're living in the mountains and you can't really grow that many crops and things like that. But what His Holiness uh, did, which was quite revolutionary, was to make the all the monasteries vegetarian. Uh, so the organisation was vegetarian, but it was up to each individual if they wanted to cook in their rooms, which people can, then they could cook whatever they wanted. So here at Lungry Tumper Center, we try and do the same thing, that the, the center is vegetarian. If we ever serve food, it's always vegetarian. But if people bring their own lunch, they can bring whatever they normally eat. We're not going to have sandwich inspection. <laughs> no, no, you have to go out with your sandwich. Whatever it is that you've brought, then that's okay. It's up to the individual. So it's a very nice, uh, pragmatic way, middle way, always. The other thing that you can do if you're not vegetarian the whole time is go vegetarian on precepts days and uh, for 24 hours, dedicate that 24 hours of being vegetarian for the health and long life of our precious gurus. So the precepts days, new moon and full moon uh, and medicine Buddha day, Tara day, uh, any of the holy Buddha days throughout the year the four major Buddha days, where everything that we do, the merit is multiplied. Then it's a great day to take precepts, to just eat the one meal a day and go vegetarian. Um, it has a, has a really powerful effect. So that's kind of an, a, an aside of, um, you know, what to eat. Uh, so I don't have a meal to demonstrate, but I've got a jar of jam. <laughs> Uh, so in the in the kind of the Latvian Eastern European tradition, when you when you have tea, you have jam and, and sugar in the tea. But if you've got a bit of a sweet tooth, um, instead of breaking out the lollies, you just get the jam. You can just sit there and you know have a few spoons of yummy jam. So here's our jar of jam, and <laughs> when we're thinking, oh, I'd like to eat something, what we've got going on is two motivations. We have a causal motivation and a momentary motivation. So usually uh, if we don't bring awareness to what we're doing, what we've got is uh, just a momentary motivation. We're just like, oh, I'm a bit bored. I think I'll go browse the fridge or I'm a bit hungry. Just grab something and eat it or, you know, I'm sitting in front of the TV and I'm a bit down and I feel like something sweet and some comfort eating, I'll go get my jar of jam. <laughs> so that's the momentary motivation. And uh, it's usually associated with what's immediately happening, with just what's coming in from the senses. Uh, and so then on a very low level, it is just motivated by the three delusions, ignorance, attachment uh, or anger dislike and so it has a an effect like that it doesn't have a very positive effect now what we can do about this is with the causal motivation so that's the motivation that we set uh, usually in the morning our causal motivation you know a very simple one would be whatever I do today may I be able to benefit others and no matter what, I'm not going to harm them. So if that's your motivation, that you get out of bed and, and you leave the house or you stay in the house, <laughs> then everything else that you do during the day is flavoured by that causal motivation. So that then when you go and have your jar of jam, the causal motivation directs 
your momentary one of why you're eating the jam. Uh, but what we can do, and as a Buddhist, you have a commitment to dedicate your food. Uh, that also becomes a causal motivation. So you have the momentary one, which is, no, I'm feeling a bit peckish or I feel like something sweet. And then you, then you bring in the causal one. Why am I eating this? And that's when we bring meaning to it. And then that way we're not just wasting all of our uh, good karma, just enjoying some jam and it's over. And now we have that much less good karma. <laughs> so one of the very simple things that we can do is recite Medicine Buddha mantra um, on the food before we eat. Tayata om bekenze bekenze maha bekenze bekenze ranza samogati soha and gently blow on the food. So I have a screen share for this uh, of the mantra. Here we go. So here's Medicine Buddha, blue, like deep unobstructed space, like the inner space, so clear, so pure. And the mantra, Taya Ta Om, Bekanze, Bekanze, Maha Bekanze, Bekanze, Radza Samugate Soha. So this mantra is incredibly powerful um, to recite over food, over um, the, the dead bodies of animals or insects even over leather garments, over the, the old clothes, maybe someone who's died even hundreds of years ago, that um, it's such a powerful mantra that if you recite this mantra and then blow, it uh, means that the, the being associated with that food or those bones, that carcass, um, their mind stream receives blessings. It is so powerful. So you recite the mantras and then and then blow because on the the mantras there on the air um, the, as you're blowing. Uh, it's so powerful because of the the vows that the medicine Buddha's made um, as they were striving for enlightenment as bodhisattvas, and then when they became enlightened, those vows became like their superpowers. They were able to help beings in all those particular ways. So this is one of the specific ways that um, Medicine Buddha can help. Uh, so this one is just great anyway. You know, you're walking along in the side of the, the footpath or driving in the side of the road and there's a dead animal. And, you know, you can stop, and get out and recite this mantra and blow. So, um, so that's one of the things that we can do. Uh, then the other thing, of course, is that we set our motivation. Why am I eating? Why am I having this jam? And how to set that causal motivation? You think, well, what's the purpose of my life? Start right there at the big question. Why am I alive? What's the meaning of my life? The purpose of my life actually is to lead all beings out of suffering and to bring them to the peerless happiness of enlightenment. That's the ultimate purpose of my life because that's what we can do as a human being. We have that opportunity as a, you know, on the Mahayana path, that's our aim. How am I going to do that? Well, I can't do it as just little old me. The only way I'm going to effectively be able to do that, lead all, all living beings out of suffering, including the ones that lost their, their lives so that I can have some jam. Um, the only way I can do that is by becoming a Buddha. So therefore, I have to eat. I have to sustain my body so that I can do that. So how do we, how do we um, then bless our food? So one of the ways is that we have our, oh, let's see. Okay, so then eating, eating the food. We have our motivation, our causal motivation. Now, if we were just a materialist, uh, you know, the probably... The, the best causal motivation that we could have as a materialist would be what the dietitians say, you know, that uh, you, you eat mindfully without doing anything else to be able to sustain your body so that you can have a good life. And um, there's nothing wrong with that. 
that's good. It's a really good starting point. And many of the dietitians say, actually, as a as a sideline here, that um, one of the best ways to lose weight is to just make sure that when you eat, you don't do anything else. You don't watch TV at the same time. You're not on your device. You don't read. You just eat, so that you're actually present. So it's a it's a very basic way of practicing mindfulness, but it is effective. Then also as a materialist, you could um, enhance a little bit by sharing the meal so that you don't eat by yourself, you eat with someone else and you have a conversation. So sharing with someone else makes it, um, you know, much nicer, much more meaningful, builds relationships. But there's much further. There's so much further than we can go. So as a Buddhist, the reason to eat would be um, you know, there's three levels. So one, we start with the Hinayana way. Then we have the Mahayana Sutra method and then the Mahayana Tantra method. So we have these three levels of how we can set our motivation and bless our food. So the, you know, we can start with the materialist way of going to eat mindfully, going to share my food to create human, you know, connections. Then the uh, Hinayana way is that you're, you're not eating just for fitness or for health to have a good life um, or for beauty to, to get all buff or, you know, be on a diet. Why you're eating, the Hinayana way is to sustain this body so that we can do Dharma practice. So that's our main motivation because, you know, we want to become liberated from all of cyclic existence. So the food becomes a support for our practice of Dharma. That's the primary uh, reason for it. And so that means that um, we're actually relieved of a whole lot of problems that can arise because if that's our main purpose, this Dharma purpose, then we're not eating out of attachment. So if, if the jam's not that good, it's okay. We won't get upset. Uh, we're not eating uh, out of anger or aversion. Uh, that kind of the disappointment that arises for if the food isn't that yummy doesn't arise and we're not eating out of ignorance. So we haven't brought those three poisons, the worldly concerns to our eating. So I'll get back to in a moment um, the ignorance part, um, not eating out of ignorance because we bring our wisdom to eating. I'll get back to that in a moment. But that's the Hinayana way, that you have the very basic reason um, is a lot more than just this life, but it's for our Dharma practice for complete liberation from samsara. Then we have the Mahayana Sutra way. And so that is that we offer um, this food to all beings. Uh, we offer the benefits to all beings. Uh, literally, so when we're having our nice jar of jam, uh, we offer to all the beings in our body. And, and that is like almost countless just right there within our body, all the tiny little microbes and the bacteria. Um, so, you know, several times I've kind of talked about this, how our body, we're actually like walking condominiums. And we're only about one, one eighth, maybe less than 10% us. <laughs> so let me explain that. And I hope it doesn't creep you out. But, you know, however many cells there are that make up our body, there are eight times more tiny little creatures that live in our body and support us. So, you know, all the way down to bacteria. So there's all the bacteria in our gut that as we know, we need or we can't digest and we die. There's, there's the bacteria in our ears that live in, our, um, in the wax in our ears that mean that our ears are all healthy and don't just get, uh, you know, humid and get, get mould in them. So I got mould in my ears when I worked in a call centre and I had really hot headphones. <laughs> so, you know, there's countless tiny, tiny little beings in there in my ears that keep my ears healthy. Then we have all the little skin mites. So there's a particular brand of skin mite that lives on your nose. 
there's particular skin mites that live all on your skin and they stop you from suffocating. Isn't that incredible? They clean our skin for us. So we have all of these beings living within our body, helping us stay alive. So when we, when we eat, we offer to them, those closest to us, and um, we think by offering to them one day when they have a human life, um, may we be able to bring them to enlightenment as well. May all of these beings that are keeping me alive now, may they be in my first circle of disciples when I become enlightened. And then we eat with bodhicitta. So we think, you know, we're, we're eating so that not only can we sustain our body and practice dharma, but so that and, and, and become liberated from suffering, but we're eating so that we can become a Buddha so we can liberate everybody from suffering. Starting with all those beings that I have a direct karmic connection with now. Um, and, you know, then they become our support for our life. We forget that we have all of these beings supporting us. And then everybody who's contributed to, um, to the food, we're eating for them directly and indirectly. May, they all, may I bring them also to enlightenment. So that's the Mahayana Sutra way. And then we have the Mahayana Tantra way, and this is mind-blowing. So this is where we think that, that ourselves, our guru, say Lamzo from Rishi, and the deity, say Medicine Buddha, are one, inextricable. And then we offer to the guru deity, and how we do that is by dissolving our sense of who we are, our limited sense of self into emptiness and arising as the deity, arising as Medicine Buddha or arising as Tara and seeing Medicine Buddha, oneself and the Guru as inseparable and then eating like the joy, the enjoyment of a, of a Buddha uh, and offering to Guru Buddha As a, as a deity, as, as a Buddha, eating as a Buddha, enjoying as a Buddha for the benefit of all sentient beings. So in this way, we make mountains of merit because we've offered to the guru deity. Now, you can only arise as a deity if you've had uh, an initiation, but that doesn't mean that we, we can't do that. What we can do is we can have the Buddha at our heart, Medicine Buddha at our heart or Shakyamuni Buddha at our heart or White Tara at our heart or Chen Rezig at our heart, thinking as that they are inseparable from the Guru. And when we eat, we offer. And the, the, the deity, you know, Medicine Buddha at our heart experiences incredible bliss as we eat. So the whole thing becomes blissful. Uh, so <laughs> then how do we do this? I've got this other screen share. So we dissolve our ordinary sense of self into emptiness because it's, it's, it's incorrect anyway. We arise as the deity, whatever our tantric practice is, or you have the Buddha arise at your heart, glowing, radiant, feeling that as not separate from your own potential to become a Buddha. And then this next uh, picture that I wanted to show you, you dissolve, um, you know, you, you dissolve all of the environment and everything into emptiness and your wisdom realising emptiness arises as this syllable, broom. And glowing white in space, the, the joyousness of your wisdom realising emptiness, your wisdom understanding reality, manifests as a syllable broom and then this syllable transforms into a beautiful bowl like a crystal bowl sparkling into a container so your wisdom realizing emptiness arises the syllable and then into the container and the foods in the container then you can recite om ahum over the food 
So the actually, you know, the 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 om and the a ah and the hum melt into light and absorb into the food, and then the food becomes blessed. And then you eat with joyousness, with that wisdom, understanding emptiness. You eat with that. You eat with uh, understanding dependent arising. Offering to the Buddha at your heart, experiencing great bliss. <laughs> so, uh, you know, dissolve everything into emptiness. Syllable broom manifests as a beautiful bowl filled with the contents. Oma hum, oma hum, oma hum. Recite the mantra. Tai ta om bekenze bekenze maha bekenze bekenze ranza samugati soha. Offer to all the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas, to the Buddha at my heart, for the benefit of all sentient beings. May all sentient beings enjoy the nourishment of the Dharma as much as this jam. <laughs> so, you know, then snacking can become part of the path to enlightenment. And that meal can last much more than a lifetime, but until all sentient beings are liberated. So what we have with this practice is based on the sutra practice of to nourish this body so that we can become liberated, adorned with the tantra practice um, of, you know, generating as a deity and offering to the deity. It's the Mahayana for the purpose of liberating all sentient beings and then we seal it with emptiness and so then that means it can't be corrupted or lost so how we seal it with emptiness we can bring in as we're eating just spend a little moment just thinking about dependent arising and emptiness that um, the whole enjoyment of the jam doesn't come from the jam it comes from this combination of the jam or the sentient beings and the virtue in my own mind ripening into happiness. And we can also recognise that even when we have that thought, oh, I feel like something sweet, even that isn't as it appears. But that's actually a false brain message. And actually, when we want something sweet, it, it actually means we need some more protein. So we can think about that too, that things aren't quite as they appear. And, and that is the key. <laughs> now, if occasionally you forget, you've got the time that it takes for the jam to travel down your, down, down your throat and, and reach your stomach. <laughs> so you've swallowed but hasn't quite reached your stomach yet. You've got just enough time to offer to say the mantra <laughs> if you forget, but please don't leave it that long. Please do it beforehand as you're looking at the food. And so then, you know, your snacking becomes part of the path to enlightenment. Uh, and it means that you enjoy the food no matter what the food is. Uh, it means that you can create merit as you're eating instead of using it all up. And, you know, you bring an, a joyous, you bring happiness onto the path to enlightenment, pleasure onto the path to enlightenment, which is so crucial because many times we might think, oh, you know, there's, we've got to give up all of that. But no, no, we need the fuel of joyousness to be able to do this work of liberating all sentient beings. Uh, and, and this will really set us up well for the rest of the Buddhist path, especially tantric practice of being able to transform joyousness and pleasure onto the path without grasping at it. So I hope you found this useful. Uh, Dharma in pyjamas, how to make a meal last a lifetime or even longer. <laughs>